I once made the mistake of uh, saying over at the mother house, we're walking through and the rooms were white, and I said, you know, I'm an architectural preservationist, so I know all these things. And I said, oh, these rooms were probably rich Victorian burgundies and golds and blues. And she said, no, we've always had it like this. <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't doing it from pig's but she just remembered that they had kept it white. But um, anyway, I was with my father the other day, who's 99, catching up with her, and I videotaped a message to you all from him, and it didn't work. But he basically, he basically said, uh, when she wanted to enter the convent, her father wouldn't let her do it right away. Uh, so she went to Seton Hill for a few years. When she graduated, she came back, and uh, at that point, went into the room. Anyway, I thought I would just uh, Now we're getting on to preservation. I'm not related to these two gentlemen. <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt and uh, William Burroughs, I think. Um, the uh, preservation movement in America uh, began really with the, uh, uh, the women who decided that it was important to preserve Mount Vernon. It was going to be sold to developers and the uh, society to, uh, for the protection of Mount Vernon was formed. That was really the very first official act. But then in 1906, when Teddy Roosevelt began preserving large tracts of American wilderness, uh, he introduced a concept of the public good and the responsibility to future generations unborn. The ownership of a piece of property didn't necessarily give you the rights to um, do whatever you want to it if it fit into this sweep of our legacy and culture. And he was buying up vast tracts of uh, wilderness. And in doing that, they came across some uh, uh, buildings and historic culture. So he created the uh, Landmark Protection Act of 1906, which was the very first legislation. And then um, they were to protect buildings like these that were um, that ended up being caught up in his preserves. Uh, it was a very important time in, in that whole development. Um, and so as we look at you know why carve out a little space for historic preservation, why try and keep some of these buildings. What we're finding now is, yes, they do have its cultural value, and that was one of the early arguments. They also had enormous economic value. Just go down to Washington Square and look. The act activity, the revitalization. We used to have to sort of stretch the argument a little when we said maybe restoring a building could be just as cost effective as tearing it down and building something new. Now we know for a fact that you can renovate those things down there and sell $450,000 condominiums in parts of town that people didn't even want to drive through a few years ago. Uh, people are looking for authenticity in America. There's a, a worldwide movement toward to move to cities, a, a condensing of the population. It's going to be driven by uh, demographics. It's going to be driven by uh, uh, energy concerns. And you know, we've reached the uh, we're sort of on the decline of using fossil fuels and oil. All those things are supported by a concentration of people. So cities are really an important aspect of, uh, of America's future. And Cincinnati has a lot to offer in that regard. And then by the environmental value of uh, preservation. There's an enormous amount of embodied energy in a building. All that, all that fuel that went into making the bricks is considered embodied energy. And by reusing it, it um, has a very big effect on the environment. And the other the, the, the thing that really uh, drives me in this process, though, is the idea that we really need our past. Without, in a world that's becoming increasingly uh, virtual and digital, uh, and moving at increasing speeds. These buildings are a way of sort of anchoring ourselves. And uh, as John Steinbeck said of Ribs of Wrath, it's this wonderful uh, moment where they're pulling out and they just have their you know, few little possessions in the truck. And I think it's one of the children that says, how will we know it's us without our past? OK, yeah, I thought we were never going to get to do this. Um, this is Cincinnati in about 1826. And, um, I didn't read my words. Oh, good, I'm going to spare you a very long quote. <laughs> um, but one of the things about cities is uh, they're, they're shaped by uh, a lot of factors. You know, it used to be people thought, well, transportation is destiny. You can go one step back farther and say, geology is destiny. In Cincinnati, they put the city where it is because of the confluence of the three rivers, the Lincoln, the Great Miami, the Little Miami, and the Ohio. It's four rivers. Um, and uh, these hills that surrounded the basin around Cincinnati, uh, hills make a very good place to, to live because you get a lot of variation as you go up and down the hill in uh, animal diversity and bioclimate and uh, 
So putting it right there in that basin, and I, you probably all know this, but Cincinnati is in a southern pole, and half of the curve is on the north side, making Mount Adams, Mount Auburn, uh, Clifton Heights, uh, Price Hill. Uh, and the other half is in Kentucky, the river kind of goes to the east. And what happened is the Wisconsin Glacier stopped about 15,000 years ago, just a little bit north of here, right around uh, Batesville. And, uh, so they, we had an area here where the geology, uh, first of all, attracted people, and then secondly, shaped the way we make our buildings. They uh, attracted a really brilliant slice of Americans at that time because we were the frontier. But uh, Daniel Drake, sitting here, is really instrumental in setting Cincinnati up as a scientific outpost uh, to the West. And I, I really admire uh, a lot of things Drake did, which one of his great legacies was the Western uh, Museum of the Western Reserve, which now is a uh, museum center and the uh, historical the, um, natural history museum. But uh, Dr. Craig did many other things too. He brought the first soda fountain to Cincinnati. And you know what's interesting about Cincinnati's history versus say Indianapolis where I grew up. Uh, we had a developer come to Cincinnati and he saw one of these pictures uh, from Indianapolis. He said, oh well he must have had the clothes wrong when they did that. But people in Cincinnati dressed like this in uh, 18, 1816. Uh, in Indianapolis, it was, the thing was founded in 1826. So just that little time difference. You know, they, they put this back at the revolution. But a lot of Revolutionary War soldiers uh, ended up living in the, the Cincinnati area. Okay, I like the idea that we had a soda fountain. But uh, it was in a pharmacy. But um, these hills that I'm talking about are really important to shaping the architecture of Cincinnati. When the uh, Irish came and settled along the river, that was fine. And the Germans came, settled a little bit north of the river, basically over the canal, which was the Rhine. So the Rhine. But they ran into the hills. <coughs> in Columbus, Indiana, Louisville, a lot of other places, they just keep spreading out. And so they were much less dense. But when they hit those hillsides, it would take an hour and a half to get a cart up the hills to uh, Mount Auburn and the other areas. So uh, this compression meant we went up higher. That's why over the Rhine it looks like Brooklyn more than it does uh, down on uh, Columbus or other Midwestern cities. And uh, obviously these hills, we went to a lot of trouble to get up the hills. You know, it's just amazing that uh, it, it shows you what an enormous obstacle it was to development that we had to do all of this to get there. But that ended up giving us a very particular architecture. And it's an architecture that is um, very indicative of where we came from as a people. And that's one of the nice records that you get in um, historic preservation of buildings. You can tell you know, where these people came from. Now, um, this is a particularly good quote. I won't spare you this one because it's on the screen. But uh, uh, Professor Matero of the University of Pennsylvania, and he just says this so beautifully here. Uh, we advocate for conservation because objects and places hold meaning, because they embody social and cultural memory which, if lost, would make the world less understandable. And I, I see in my job buildings torn down almost every week. Some of them you understand, you know, it has a real problem. Uh, a lot of them are just poor decision making by the people involved. And it, it just kills me because they are a non-renewable resource. Every time we lose one from the 1850s, you know, the, the number that we still have there goes down. And when they're done, it's all, it always looks like it was a reasonable or you know, the right thing to have done. Uh, I mentioned the Revolutionary War soldiers. I don't know if any of you have heard uh, Sergeant William Brown, but uh, he's buried in this cemetery. And he is a, probably one of the most important soldiers in the Revolutionary War. And that's not my opinion, that was George Washington's. Washington gave out three uh, medals that he invented for these three individuals. It was called the Badge of Military Merit, and now it's the, it's the equivalent of the Congressional Medal of Honor. And only three people in the entire world were given these. William Brown was one of them. He moved to Cincinnati in 17, probably 1792, and lived in Columbia. Uh, he's buried here somewhere. We're not quite sure where. Uh, the cemetery is practically abandoned. And we're working with the Society of Colonial Wars and the University of Cincinnati Department of Archaeology. We sponsored a ground uh, 